Hello everyone and welcome to, uh, I think this is, must be one of my first virtual interviews uh, on JTV. Um, within a matter of a few weeks, our entire world pretty much, the whole planet has been, has been transformed uh, through a series of government measures to encourage social distancing, avoid large gatherings, telling people to work from home where they can. And we're trying to um, you know, follow all the, all the guidelines and measures, but we still have to keep creating content. We still have to continue leading our lives. And we thought it'd be a good idea to invite some of our regular guests onto, uh, onto the program to talk about what's going on in the world. And we don't just have to talk about the coronavirus situation. We can talk about other topics as well. But I feel like you can't ignore such a you know significant moment in 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 world history right now um and we feel it's important to discuss them reflect on them and see how we can make the most of the situation so we're joined uh today by rabbi daniel rowe who is the executive director of ace uk which is uh, a superb jewish outreach uh, organization which really touched my life actually in many many ways um, and really kind of helped to make me the first kind of person that I am today in terms of my Jewish values so extremely grateful to HUK and uh, their, all the work they do. Uh, Rabbi Rowe thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure thank you. And uh, you're currently at home I assume <laughs> working from home like everyone else. Yeah socially isolating. Yeah so tell me what are your what are your reflections on what's what's front and center of your, your mind right now in terms of what's going on? Well, I think front and center is, is definitely the people who really are struggling, that there really are people who are, are in a health danger uh, because of age or immunosuppressant systems or, or otherwise, or without realizing we're taking things like ibuprofen and might now be in more danger. There's people struggling in hospitals right now as we speak. There's also people struggling with social isolation. Um, there's, there's people economically struggling and there's, there's healthcare workers being overwhelmed as well. So there's a lot to put at the front of our mind. As well as that, I, I think we have to also be working a lot about on calm. You know, I'm telling a lot of people to, if you're in a basically roughly healthy situation, don't, don't spend the whole day now following the news and social media. It's, it's an environment of a lot of anxiety. Yeah, you'll go and crazy. Spreading anxiety. And, uh, and I think we need to be, be voices and bastions of calm. And it's also at the same time an opportunity for a lot of good. There's a lot of people who need us who we can be reaching out to and helping even from behind screens. And, and uh, you know, we spoke about social, social isolation. It's, it doesn't have to be social isolation, it's physical isolation. We can be very much socially in touch with people who need us to be. Um, and, and so there's a, there's a lot going on in all that, but those are things, are some of the things right at the front of, of our minds here. And you actually made a Facebook post a couple of days ago talking about some of your reflections and you listed uh, some quite practical things actually uh, to, in, to, to help people. And one of the things that I think is naturally going to happen right now is there's conflict is probably, there's more potential for conflict right now, especially when it comes to family conflict. People are going to be feel more on top of each other in their homes. And w w what are some of the most important things that you think w are helpful for people, especially families? Uh, to to help them to avoid getting into you know too much conflict when they're when they're at home together. I think there's a few things. First of all, just the simplest. It, it just let's start by being tolerant and aware that it is going to be difficult. You know, one of the things we sometimes do is we, as, let's say, as a parent, uh, we're struggling and the whole thing is struggling. We start getting agitated and angry that we're failures. Let's understand that it's going to be tough. There's going to be times, depending on the size of the family and its natural dynamics and the length this goes on for and, and various other things, this could be difficult for people. Um, and just accept that it won't always be perfect. I think one or two tips that, have, that are, are potentially valuable. One is to always try and be a giver in all relationships. To you know, If we've got a five or six people in the same house as us or 10 people in the same house as us or whatever the number is, can we give a little bit of thought to something nice we can do for each one of them on a given day, right? Just think a little bit about others. Giving produces a better attitude within us and it obviously makes others around us happy too. I would say second of all, remembering to give to ourselves, then if I'm up to second or third, whatever number I'm up to, remembering to give to ourselves. If we're gonna be in a stressful situation, taking a bit of time out once or twice a day, even for short periods of time, just to put ourselves in the right mind state will be make us better givers for others. Um, I think communication is absolutely key. And I'll give you an example. Yeah, a standard situation, you might have one parent who's on an important call or meeting at 10.30 till 12.30. Maybe it's business, maybe it's a family member, another who expects to go out shopping at that particular moment, maybe for the family or maybe for somebody down the road who needs help. And you've got kids who expect to be in a class at that moment. It's a recipe for disaster. If people just literally sat the night before, went through the main highlights of the day and it worked it around, then they, one of them could have moved 
the 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 uh, the meeting or the shopping or something so that we don't run into these sorts of problems. When do we ex expect to be eating and, and doing different things? Those simple communication can, can alleviate a lot of these things. And the final thing is there's actually big advantages of all being at home. There really, really are. I know it's funny, but if we start to flip our brains and think one sec, can we turn this into a positive? It's not so difficult. Yet anyone who's kept a Shabbat meal knows the power of a phones off sitting together. Can we do that every day of the week for supper or three times a week? You know, can we have, um, we also have the ability to work flexible hours if we're working. Can we plan those hours around the key times that we need to be with our kids and stuff? So those, those I think are some very, very important guidelines. But again, remembering not to get stressed if it doesn't work out too much. It's yeah, okay. And, and what about what about if, if people feel they have family members who, you know, you talk about communication, they feel like they're not great at communication or they don't listen to people's concerns or issues or whatever. Is it best just to, is your view better, better to just keep it in, keep stum? Well, look, uh, you can sometimes try and say every situation is so different you know some situations need professionals to help with but in a normal scenario one person is less good at communicating you can say look you know generally speaking it's better not to sound like we're criticizing people not you are bad at communication this is hurting us but <clears throat> to almost flip it around i hope you don't mind i'm really struggling because in this sort of environment i need a little more communication do you mind if, if perhaps we just spent 20 minutes talking about about what you're thinking about tomorrow or you're thinking right now those are always helpful ways of of uh, trying to interact. And generally speaking, I know it's easier said than done. What? So you're not attacking them, basically. Yeah, yeah. I would say generally right. speaking, much easier said than done. But when we're resentful and angry at people, we communicate less well with them as well. Um, you know, so wait, wait for that little discussion for when we're in a better place. Right. Absolutely. And um, let's talk also about just broader relationships. What what would be your top advice for? right now i mean people some people are actually having more time to spend uh, you know working on their relationships developing relationships they have more time to reach out to people but but even forgetting the whole situation we're in right now what would be what do you think are the most important things when it comes to developing good relationships in all in all kinds of ways with parents grandparents uh friends with uh your boss or your employees what what do you think are the sort of key underlying principles that 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 apply to all all different relationships all relations depend on giving on communication and on being very aware of where we're coming from giving means not just giving gifts but giving time why aware of where we're coming from what's that why why do we need to be aware of where, uh, we're, where, where from? we're coming from is like this because in a, in a related well communication i've explained as well and i think it really is important but uh but in terms of where we're coming from is if we feel negative about somebody, we're feeling a resentment, let's say, an, an anger, something upsetting, there's typically a lot going on beneath that. In fact, there always is. It's, it's not only what they've done to us that's usually at play. Again, unless there are exceptions in one particular group of people we have to really be thinking about are people who are in very unhealthy relationships who are now going to really struggle with being isolated, you know. But in normal scenarios where there's just everyday frictions in relationships, behind resentments are usually not just what the other person did to me, but my whole world that interprets it. So, for example, um, you know, I may have expected to be on a phone call with somebody and they didn't get on the, the other side of the call. I've now got angry with them. What's going on? I'm a little bit afraid that they may not be like me. I've got pride and that's been hurt. I've got this, that and the other. You know, my brain starts conjuring up all sorts of scenarios. Um, and uh, and sorry, just one sec. Okay, that's part of the part of the beauties of doing interviews in the home. It, it, things popping in that. So, so let me just stop and reflect and realize that my anger has actually been caused partly by my pride, partly by my fears, partly by things like that. And when I have that awareness, that helps me understand that it's not the fact that they didn't call me when I expected that's causing the anger. Um, you know, and then there's different things. Do I, do I pray a little bit for that to be removed? Do I, do I just become aware of it and let it drop? There's different approaches to dealing with all that. But being very aware, there'll be a lot of stuff tensions, fears, anxieties going on inside me that might provoke reactions that are probably going on inside the other people too. That's also worth thinking about. They're screamed just now, but they're probably going through a tough time. You know, being aware of those sorts of things can be very, very helpful in relationships. I, I, I've honestly found one of the hardest things that I've learned or I'm learning is that one of the hardest things to balance in a relationship is to know when you should stand up for yourself and know when to just take a step back and, and not, not create a fuss. How do you get that, that balance right? Yeah, there's, there's a third one, which is not necessarily the standing up for oneself and not necessarily walking away, but it is communicating right. uh, the fact that, that something has hurt us. Again, I always think in, in relationships, when there's a two-way clash that we've been hurt by somebody, 
not expressing it as the fault in them because that's the best only part of the picture but just expressing the reality that i'm in pain i'm not saying you did anything wrong i'm just saying that i am hurt as a result of that is it possible that we could talk about so surely but you sometimes know, it's sometimes surely it is valuable to even if you're hurt to to not say something maybe you there, there are times i think i think that are, i think is a general rule um, again, some of this is going to veer into areas that, re that professionalism is beyond rabbinic qualification here. But, uh, but I think one or two of the uh, very important things is, is, is it a small incidental issue that's one off or is it part of a pattern? If it's a pattern and can I cope with it or can't I? If it's sort of pattern which I'm not going to be able to long term really work with and just drop all the time, it's building resentment within me, then it probably should be communicated. If it's literally the, the, the one off thing that, that's not a big deal or it's just because I'm in a bad mood that I'm even bothered by it, so let it go. It work on myself. Um, something else that I've been thinking about recently, and, and I remember learning about this in, in school, that, that during the war, there was more of a sense of, in a sense, uh, being more, a sense of being more free to do things and more, more, uh, um, more risk taking, more making maybe rash decisions that you might not necessarily do if in more sort of uh, calm times. Um, and I just wonder, you know, during more challenging times, I'm, so, I'm not comparing right now what we're going to through, through to the war, but during challenging times, sometimes there is a temptation to let go a little bit in a negative way uh, and only think about the short term and only like live for today. Uh, and perhaps one example could be maybe people jumping into uh you know intimate relationships uh in order to perhaps to seek comfort or something like that um is that wrong is it wrong to to shift your mindset to one that's a little bit more um short term you know <laughs> i mean the example's an interesting example uh you mean do people have a tendency to be rash it could be uh, you know and i think with all decisions if they're going to have long-term consequences we should always pause and, and hesitate and give some long-term thought to them um but in general, can people, uh, let's ask a slightly different question, which is, can people be more adaptive in all sorts of areas of life? The answer is yes. We, we, that we don't ever want a situation like this one to occur. But when it does occur, it breaks our routine and it suddenly allows us the freedom to do things. Uh, and there aren't, it's not going to be for very long before we all readjust to this. But in that little disruptive uh, moment, we can, we can break into new paradigms, you know, organizationally, individually, spiritually, and, and all sorts of families. We can suddenly start to think about new dynamics and new opportunities um, that the everyday routines until now have never given us permission to do. But there, do, do you hear what the point I'm making about that, that people... Can people be rash and jump into things? Absolutely, of course they can. You know, the people in, in, anxiety, in anxious situations going to look for, for quick comforts? Yes, that can happen too. Are those comforts often long-term mistakes? Yeah, they can be. And again, that's why we should never really make decisions from fear, never make decisions from anger. You know, never make decisions unless we feel we're in a place, big long-term consequential decisions, unless we're in a place of, of well-being and calm and able to use our, our, our God-given, very powerful brains to help analyze situations well. But you're saying that there's also a flip side, which is positive, which is that this could be a chance for people to make good decisions that they might not otherwise have done and that, it is when it's like this if we've thought through life what life's about you know often we we sort of wish we could do certain things that we wish we could take time to you know a great example sunday i was just speaking to today always wanted to study torah right they just wanted to go they couldn't go to yeshiva they couldn't whatever it was uh they didn't come from a very jewishly knowledgeable background and for them yes they're still working now but they've got a lot less time commuting there's a lot less stress at work for better or for worse. So there's a different type of there's anxiety over their job, but they're, they're, their work is, is doing less work and they've got more time on their hands now. So they're using this to study areas of, of Torah, learn to read Hebrew, things they wouldn't have done otherwise. Um, so, that, yes, opportunities to jump into things and do things that we wouldn't normally have done. Organizations that, you know, like ourselves that have been talking a lot about increasing the amount of online learning that we do, we just had to do it. So we've now done it in a very significant way. And we're actually learning with more people than a normal week would have been till now. So there's a lot of areas where, where people can move into new spaces. But I think there's an even deeper one, which is because it's a crisis that's going to pass. You know, how long it lasts will depend on how deep and how long long term behavioral changes will take place if it's a matter of weeks we'll probably revert straight back and be happy to go back to offices and wherever right. if it's a matter of months eventually the human will learn to prefer 
and work better in the environments we're in. And that will raise interesting questions about what the new social dynamics are. Like, will people seriously not be pressuring universities, for example? If, if we spend three months, students now uh, learning online, will they not wake up one day and parents and governments and say, why is it so expensive to send our kids the middle of England to meet the 7,245th best lecturer in the world or 723rd best lecturer in the world uh, for eight months or six months of a year when we could just go online, have the best lecturer in the world, find a tutor. Why, why aren't universities all designed? Why isn't there just one big or central, two or three big central universities that each cost 500 pounds a term that every kid in Africa can get Harvard University? So those sorts of things will become real, real issues of questions. But in, in the main, if it's going to be By the way, we may actually learn the opposite, that our need for being in so all kinds of a social ver ver variety of social experiences and, you know, that, that it can't just work doing everything online. Yeah, I happen to think universities is, is a little ludicrous. They still exist. They should have been moved online long ago. Um, it's, it's a scam because it's not fair. And all, every kid in Africa, every kid, every kid everywhere in the world, forget in Africa, every, every deprived kid. And do you feel, do you feel the same not, about Jewish learning? Everyone could have the world's best education. I really think that's something governments should look into, but separate from now. Do you, not do you feel the same discussion. about Jewish learning? Jewish learning, I think, is in a very similar way too. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think there are opportunities that online learning provides. It gives the best educators access to everybody and everyone access to the best educators. That's something which, which in the current models of you have to be in the same brick building as them, deprives most of the world of access to the best education. I think the, the, in the internet age, we should be insisting that everyone in the world can have the best education and the cost of it should be should be very, very cheap. Yeah. It really is not expensive for the world's best teachers and educators in every field to be communicating with the whole world. It really isn't expensive. Yeah, if everyone's chipping in a tutors. tiny, tiny amount, you know, if you've got so many people on it, then for sure it could work. On what? There are plenty of platforms, yeah. but that's the smallest problem. Right. Governments can work around those right. things. Right, Gov governments can, yeah, absolutely. I will say something else that, which I think is also important, is that assuming it's a relatively short-term situation, the, the most in innovative and important thing it can bring out within us is goodness. And there's a lot of innovation we can do in goodness. You know, we've seen, again, a charity I'm very close to is Gift. Uh, they work together with us in the building in Asia. We're a partner, organ a sister kind of organization. And you see what they've done, the amount of people volunteering now, and the amount of organizations calling, and different creative ways. Somebody can play guitar, teach somebody guitar lessons. Somebody can, can you know, run a, a free gym class for people who need. People can be calling older people. People can be delivering things for people. There's just gonna be more and more creative ways that people can help one another. And that is somewhere where something which I think really can, is something we should, these sorts of crises bring out greatness and, and offer us huge opportunities to help others, huge in ways that we never thought we would. Absolutely. Um, so many people are saying that they're, after a few days of self-isolating or being quarantined, they're starting to, you know, bug out basically and, and, and lose their minds. Uh, I've seen funny videos and pictures of people, you know, getting bored and coming up with all kinds of funny, uh, you know, obstacle courses and things in their house because they, they've got nothing better to do. Um, is, it, is it a good thing, in your view, to learn to be content being alone? Um, but and I suspect you will probably say yes, but doesn't the Torah tell us that it's not good for people to be alone? It says in Genesis, it's not good for man to be alone. Hmm. It's not good for man to be alone, and we should be making sure that we're not alone. Um, and more than that, it's not just ourselves, it's not good for others to be alone. Let's make sure they're not alone too. The beauties, are, you know, we talk a lot sometimes about the the, the perils of of all the technological um, innovations that have occurred and, and the, uh, the social media, but there's a lot of good in this as well. There really is, you know, had this crisis occurred 20 years ago, there were a lot more people alone. Yeah. We could be reaching We wouldn't out be doing this there. right now, 20 years What's ago. That? We wouldn't be doing this 20 years ago. Yeah, this interview right now, exactly. So, uh, but so many people we can be, we can be daily in contact with, even a simpler device as a phone, but even more so with being able to see people on Zoom, on FaceTime and so on. There's huge ability to not be in total isolation. Um, and, and that I think is very, very important. It's yes, you're 100 percent right. The terrorists La Tova Southern Rada is not good for man to be alone. Let's make sure that people out there don't need to be alone. Right. And when we need to reach out, let's make sure we're not alone. But I'm I'm you know? I'm some I'm uh, so, but do you not think is is there a place for learning how to be comfortable being alone, being okay there's with yourself, place, with your a, own right. thoughts? I think there's, there's a place for learning how not to have to run away. You know, a part, part of the problem people are learning to be alone is, is they're not dealing with the struggles that they're dealing with. So we often come with a lot of stress levels and, and learning to be calm, learning to achieve calm, learning to achieve a relationship with God. The, these things are really, really powerful and they help us be better givers for the rest of our lives as well. Better, more calm people. 
and more serene people and, and just better people for giving out that to the world. So yes, there's a place to learn to be alone, but alone ultimately for the sake of reconnecting and, and re-giving and, and building relationships together. It's interesting because I, like, I've seen self-help books and, and you know, life coaches and all these kind of things. Some, sometimes I've, I've heard people saying, or maybe spiritual uh, guides in, in, other, in other religions that it's, if, if you're not okay being alone, and just being at one with yourself, then it, it, it represents that you're, it shows that you're not sort of dealing with, you know, basically saying that you should be okay to be, be, on, be by yourself. Um, I think, I think, that, I think a certain yeah, degree you're not of dealing with okay. issues if you, yeah. if you, you know. I think it's like all, like concentric circles. We, in Judaism, we look at the world as, as, a, as collective as well as individuals. So there's certainly, a, a, um, the human is meant to be in interaction with others and meant to be building others around us and being built with them together. That said, you know, if you've got a faulty piece of machinery, a faulty cell in a body, you want that cell to be able to, 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 uh, to rectify. It, it could be that one of the best ways to rectify sometimes is in, in work with others, but often it is by being alone with ourselves. That's when we hear and feel the stresses that are going on within us. And if we can move to a place of deep relationship with God, you know, just shutting our eyes and, and just feel that connection with God and, and feel ourselves a channel for God's love to others, that could be one of the greatest cleaning out processes that we then go back into those relationships with and back as in, and both grow and give to others uh, better as a result. And two questions on the topic of when God says it's not good for man to be alone. First question is, does that imply that if you're just basically, you're just relying on God, let's say, and your relationship is just with God, then you're alone because God was, al God was already there with, with Adam. It's, again, there's no question that ultimate answer is that it's not good for man to be alone is to be in relationship. But relationship with, with human beings or is, it, is, he, is he saying beings. that it's with not human, enough just to have a relationship with God, basically? Of course there's a relationship with God, but God built a world where we need relationship with one another and, and where it's the together that comes to in relationship with God. We pray collectively, and, and the point of that is that we our relationship with God is collective too. It's both as individual, but also as a family. Um, it's, it's a couple, when if a couple's married, but it's as a family, as a community, as a nation, and as humanity, all of those are in different relationships with God, and we're parts of all of them. And in general, you know, when things are together, they produce properties that are greater than them individually. So we're not there to be self-centered, even spiritually. Um, all that we do to our relationship with God is for the sake of bringing it back to others and, and bringing it to others is, is part of enhancing yourself. Really, if it's ever about self versus others, there's probably both of them are going to not work very well. When we, we, It's okay to build ourselves to be a better vehicle to give to others. And in giving to others, we build ourselves. So they're really part of one big organic process that's all interconnected. And also just one last question on this topic. When God says it's not good for man to be alone, didn't, I mean, he's God. <laughs> didn't he already know this? Of course, but God wanted, God wanted, with everything creation, God creates a stage of imperfection before perfection in order that we understand and feel within ourselves that it's not good for man to be alone. When God says not good for man to be alone, that builds a reality into creation where we feel and we're aware of that it's not good for oh, us wow. to be alone. And what, why do we need that awareness? That it... We need the awareness, otherwise we'd do it. Otherwise we'd all sit, there is a drive within us to be alone, right? There's a drive that says it is good for me to be separate from you. And alone, by the way, we can be alone running around the world in interaction with people. Alone means I'm standing here for myself. You're out there as forums to, to, to make me feel happy and I use you. That's called being alone. We need a voice inside us that says this is not good. We, we, need, we need one another. We need to connect to one another. We need to be in relationship with one another, giving to one another and so on. Absolutely. Um, I want to turn now to questions of spirituality in this, uh, with regard to what's going on at the moment in the world. Um, you're, you're seeing some people, not just in Ju the Jewish, re Jewish religion, but all kinds of religions and all kinds of spiritual uh, people who are saying, God is doing this to the world because of X or because of Y. Um, is this wise to say? Is it wise even to speculate on these questions? So there's a very interesting debate in Jewish, amongst Jewish theologians. There's a famous book called Torah Savram, which does teach a person in their own individual life, if they tune in, how they can read messages from God, even without prophecy. That said, on, on collective mass scale, it's, uh, you know, I think you need prophecy to be able to answer questions like this. Um, because amongst other things, there's a concept called Hanukkah Sayyichud, where God is driving creation in pathways as part of a tapestry or, or, or scenario that's way greater than we can see. And something like this that affects all of humanity uh, and is pushing and driving things, it's very hard for us to give a specific 
God's doing it because of A. For, for one thing, it's very hard to say what all of humanity would have been doing wrong together anyway. Um, but what we can talk about is what it, something like this is bizarre. It is strange. And therefore, it's calling upon us to, re, to respond. And the res, what, what response we produce may well be a part of the plan. We don't know the plan. I really think it's important. We don't know God's plan. We know that God's driving history in ways that we don't fathom or, or imagine, assuming I'm talking about believers in God. There might be people out there who disagree with the, the fundamental philosophy behind this. But in principle, we're going with the Jewish uh, traditional theological philosophical worldview, and there's several of them. But generally speaking, we would see God driving the general patterns of history. But for us, it's how do we rise to the moment? How do we, you know, on the one hand, how do we not get crushed by it? But more than just how do we get through it, how do we rise to it? There's there's a response being called upon, and that is for us to rise. And I believe that we do have the ability to rise here and, and become much greater. I think we could get outside of ourselves and to the givers, to those in the same isolation as us, if there are, and to those beyond. Who needs our help? How can we help them? What can we do to become greater? How can we further our relationship with God and with others? How can we become greater givers? How can we exude goodness out there to the world? How can we become generals in the battlefield of bringing good into the world that will that can long outlast this virus? Long outlast. Right. And on the topic of speculation, I, I, you know, I see people saying, oh, this is a sign of the end times. It's a sign of Moshiach, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, is it? <laughs> what, do you, what do you think when, when you see? I wish I had that? prophecy that some of the greatest prophets in the biblical time tried to work out when, when the messianic era is coming. Um, my understanding is the messianic era comes when humanity brings it about. Um, and therefore, it, for, who knows, is it a potential portal that offers a chance? Are there certain portals in history? Could this be one of them? Possibly. I, I think personally that what we need to shape our view is just the knowledge that history will arc eventually to a messianic moment and to a moment when we look back and see that all our good actions brought it about and always live our good actions as if every single one of them could tilt the whole world which by the way this virus certainly teaches us it shows you literally a sneeze in a market in china literally can affect seven billion people within a few weeks and that means that literally acts of goodness will also move one person at a time and affect seven billion people within a few weeks Let's not forget that, and let's uh, let's make that lesson out outlive this as well. We're very interconnected. One relation at a time, one sneeze at a time, one handshake at a time. The world is affected. So, seeing as that, those are sorts of things which I think are are, are very profound and important. Yes. So the notion of, of the a messianic end should shape every act we do all the time. Speculating over when they we're about to Mashiach, I, I don't know. I hope it's true. I hope it's today. But uh, I, I don't know if we have the gift of prophecy to know these things. And why should someone want? In, in the in the Jewish perspective, why should someone want the, the messianic era? Why should well, I think it's very it? comforting you know, in an anxious moment to know that it's all going to come out the other side for the good is good. But I, I think the correct use for this attitude, it is deeply embedded into Judaism. I think Rabbi Sachs pointed out once that, the you know, we, we often read in, in self-help books and business help books that, that in some culture, Chinese, I think the idiom for for or the word for crisis is similar to the word for opportunity. And he points out that in Hebrew, we have an even stronger um word which is mashper the word for crisis is mashper and that's a word for a birthing stool that after a crisis things won't be the same again but they have an opportunity to bring things even greater than were before and collectively as a jewish people we've always embraced the aftermath of every crisis with a building of something that is greater than had previously existed uh nationally we've done that and we try, strive to do that individually during a crisis, it's not easy for us to work out what it will be, but during crisis, we can rise together. And that's what I think we have to do right now. Right now, people need us. It's time to get out of wallowing in self-pity and fear and anxiety and start to think about our usefulness to others and our giving to others and our growing of ourselves and others. And once this all moves away, there might be something much greater built into humanity than, and into ourselves and into the Jewish people than, than was before. And... You know, there, people, there's there's a crisis. This is a crisis right now, which is which is touching everyone. Um, but this next question applies to pe people who are experiencing personal crises, um, which is how, how can you how can you cling to God and, and faith when you feel like he is the source of creating so much chaos, fear, instability? Well, we do not believe that God has made the world the way the world is meant to be. He created a world with opportunity. The whole point of the sin of Adam is we left that world. We entered this one uh, full of, of all sorts of things that are wrong. And, and really speaking, um, part of God and man together, but especially man, are meant to be bringing the world to perfection. Um, so, you know, if we suddenly woke up today and for the first time noticed that people die in the world, then maybe there's been something wrong with us all this time. 
what we never notice that human beings die in massive numbers every single year from illnesses. Yes, we're meant to be outraged by that. We're meant to want this world the way it is now to end and get to a much better state. We're meant to do all we can to lift humanity to that state, uh, the state of the Garden of Eden, the state of the oneness of the whole world where we're one and we transcend our normal limits and connect to God. That, that's where we're heading to. That's what we're going to be doing. You know, the, the, there's nothing, there's no evil or, or no suffering being created by this virus that wasn't there before. There were people dying before every year from flus, from all sorts of things. But so you're saying, but how would jobs? That, how, how there would might that... be a lot more economically right now. Might, the, the illness might come, health-wise, might be a lot more people at the same time. But how does that but put the, you at the ease? Your world you're... and it's outrageous was was already there. But how does that put you at ease? You're going through a crisis, so you think, oh, we're, you're you know, not meant to be at ease. I think a lot of people look to theology to make them at ease. The whole point of this world is we're not meant to be at ease. We're not meant to be tolerant of the pain that's in the world. We're meant to be acutely aware of it. We don't believe God does bad things in the sense that ultimately everything's for the good, although we can use the word ra about bad about certain things. But we certainly believe that God allows painful things to happen or even the world is in a painful state because humanity is in a broken state. We're not, not blaming humans for it, but we're in this world for short times. We're put into the world for literally short amounts of life to bring healing to the world, to bring it closer to the end it's meant to be. We're not meant to be comfortable in this world. We're not meant to find it an easy, you know, easy world to be in, right? The, the, the Torah speaks, the, the rabbis speak about when Jacob and Yaakov uh, tried to rest at his old age and, 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 the, and God says, this is not the time for resting. It's a world for being agitated, being for, for seeing that it's painful, that others suffer in this world, and we should be doing something about it. Sometimes we can literally do something about it. We can literally give charity and, and heal poverty, or give education and heal ignorance, or give health and, and heal illness. Sometimes we can. And then on a deeper level, we're meant to be healing humanity in a spiritual sense and in a, in a loving sense, bringing about the world to its perfected state. So no, we're not. it's not meant to be comforting. These aren't, aren't do, I think... The Jewish approach to, to evil is not comforting in the simple sense at all, because there's nothing simple or, or comfortable about this world. Um, it is meant to be a world we wrestle with, a world we're uncomfortable with, and a world we're driven to change. Faith that in the end is part of a big picture that will lead to goodness. Faith that I don't need to be the director of the world God can be, and I'll just fulfill my role to the best of my ability. Well, that faith is, from that the anxiety isn't it? of facing the abyss of the fact that it could all go horribly wrong, not just from my perspective, but humanity could could end or something like that. that that's, what, that's what faith offers us. It offers us a sense that behind the picture that we don't see is meaning, and behind the actions that we do do that are good, that don't seem to change the world, really the world is tilting and changing, and they do have infinite significance. Isn't that comforting? If that comforts them, fantastic. But it should never comfort to the point where we don't feel pain from somebody else's suffering or that we don't feel responsibility to make the world a better place. Well, let, let me ask you this. Is, is it insensitive, do you think, to talk about silver linings to this crisis or indeed any crisis uh, when many people are suffering as a result of it? Um, I think it depends to whom we're talking. Sensitivity, by definition, requires being sensitive to the person we're talking. If we're talking about somebody who's who's anxious over a relative whose health is seriously threatened, then I don't think it's the appropriate conversation to talk about the good things that are going to happen in the world, unless the specific individual is, is comforted in some way by it. There, we, there, that's the type of comfort that we are allowed to have, right? Um, so I think we need to be sensitive to each situation. If we're talking to somebody who's just lost their job or is afraid their business is about to collapse, now's probably not the time to to, to necessarily if some people it is helpful to talk about silver linings but for others they just want a listening ear they want someone they can call someone they can they can uh, talk to about it and, and and that's the right time if somebody's just lost somebody whether through corona or through any other illness they can't sit shiver for them they can't attend their own funeral they want our ear at that moment this is a time to listen and be caring and be there but in general um for for the majority of the world who are healthy and who will be coming through this being calm and, and looking for the good is actually very important, not just for putting ourselves in a state of calm, but actually use this as a moment now to not just get through this, but to literally become better people, to literally, there's so many people who need us, let's go out there and help them. You know, there's so much opportunity for growth, let's take it. I wouldn't even call those silver linings. Um, well, you can, I mean, it depends how you look at it, but they are they are things that are, are opportunities and, and needed. If we could do them, we'll help others be happy. So I think, and others have a better time. So I think it depends who we're talking to and in what context. Um, there's context where talking about silver linings is very inappropriate. 
and a context where talking at all is inappropriate some context where listening is, is what we've got to do crying with somebody being more of a proverbial shoulder when we can't be a physical one uh and so on and there's other good i have had phone calls with people at shivers and it's difficult being in a shiver right now sitting down the ground staring at a wall Absolutely. not I having been able necessarily to even go to the funeral you know there's a lot of, of things people are struggling with right now there's health workers who could just appreciate a phone call um or, or reaching out to them other ways we can help you or, or just i just want you to know how much we appreciate the incredible self-sacrifice and the hard work you're doing right now and so there's so many people that, that we can so it depends on the conversation depends on the person depends on the situation absolutely and um i guess the same question does it what about humor you know is there a place for humor during crisis there is and look i think in general i'm not so uh excited by things that are pumping out all over whatsapp and all over facebook i'm not criticizing anyone who does them i think a lot of people they, they express the anxiety in those ways i think the problem with throwing something out to the masses even if it's a nice warning like be you know be or, or an opinion we should be more isolating more or, or humor we do need to remember that on mass groups there's going to be a lot of people experiencing different things so we'll put humor out there where somebody is either having a is very afraid of their own health uh, they have a low immune system or a relative of theirs who's now coughing who's elderly or, or you know or, or a relative who's asked them to come and visit but they're not sure and we're throwing humor might be inappropriate on even even things like pushing people to isolate more which is very, which is good on the one hand but in a mass audience there might be somebody out there who's literally going through emotional trauma and and, and you know we need to just realize that in groups I'm not sure, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not, I got forbid to criticize anyone who's doing this. The part of the problem is whenever you give a message, somebody's not going to say, oh, look at them, they're doing something wrong. We're all learning this. We're really all in it together. We have to be tolerant of each other, and, you know, but I think there's a place for humor. Of course there is. The human needs humor. That, that's a big part of what we are. Uh, and for the right person, it's the right thing. But again, we have to just be, it's to whatever extent we can be sensitive to the fact that, that it's not for everyone in every situation. There's, there's a bit of a, I'm starting to see this online now on, on Twitter as well, of people are starting to talk about blame, uh, you know, being able to point the finger. Uh, for example, at the Chinese government, there's talks of cover-ups and you, could they have done something about this earlier on? Um, I know we as Jews are so sensitive to this issue of scapegoating. Um, and my question is, well, what about when sometimes actually the the talking about blaming someone they, they genuinely have done something wrong like for example we would point the finger you know to make not to compare in any way but we would point the finger at hitler and in a sense it's quite cathartic to do that it's 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 a very uncomfortable question for us to ask but is there any is there something cathartic or potentially pragmatic about being able to at least say oh okay they did this they're the ones that you know that, that made this happen well one of the reactions to every difficult situation is anger you know, we want it to end. We've got a primitive brain that says, hey, there's a threat. Let's destroy the threat. That anger wants an outlet. And um, and so therefore we go looking for who to blame. We can get angry at anyone from a doctor to God to a government to who knows what, to, to people who are not isolating enough, you know, and, and all these kind of things. We can throw lots of anger in all directions. It's not usually very helpful. It's more helpful to just admit that we're anxious and that anxiety is normal and that we can and just try and understand uh, to get ourselves into a space of calm. That said, I think it's, it's to, you know, it's certainly not the type of blame like a uh, 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 blame for human inflicted tragedy that no human created this virus, as far as any of us can tell, right? This is not created by humans. The viruses have been sitting there in the natural world for a long time. We've been very blessed for the last hundred years not to have uh, a dangerous pandemic like this one. Um, and especially one with this, what makes it particularly complex is the silent incubation that allows it to spread en masse more than a cold or a flu or other things, so, or other coronaviruses. So yeah, that's not a human's fault. Can we look back afterwards and see, well, inevitably there's also pol politicians and, and they're gonna wanna make sure the blame isn't too much on them. And, you know, so yeah, there'll be a blame game. But I actually think this should be a moment to the best of our ability to realize that this virus shows us how much we have in common as humans. It's probably the first time in human history that we are all aware of facing a threat together. We have faced threats together, but just not been aware of them in the past. And then very often big human crises, often wars or I famines. actually asked a friend, I said, what percentage of humanity do you think isn't aware of what's going on right now? Other than young people, uh, like babies. Like well, what? I, I, truth is, Europe is right now the epicenter and it's moving clearly across America. I don't know if there's, I haven't, right, I've tried, you know, we're so self-centered. Maybe there's countries in the world that don't have it as much, but it certainly can spread very quickly to everywhere. Anyone who doesn't have it yet could have it. 
tomorrow. So it's something, and it's something where the solution is going to be there for all of us. What it, the reason it, it it's so dangerous is a we all share the same bodies. I mean, yes, they may be different, different skin color, different sizes, different shapes, but ultimately it's the same. The genes are so similar that a virus that can affect me can affect you. And number two is we're in such tight social contact that a simpler thing as as, as going to somebody's house, even though I may not personally be in danger because I'm young enough and, and, and you know, but we, we will sooner or later spread to somebody who is vulnerable. So the sense that we're in this together, I think should be something very powerful that remains with us forever long after this. And the sense that, that, and I do think this is beautiful. Let, let's look at the positives here, right? Let's look at the incredible things. The fact is that so many people are isolating. Isn't that incredible? Do you know the economic price, the, 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 the local immediate stress that's giving to all the people isolating and we're doing it to save lives? Who would have thought humanity has that within us? That's remarkable. Yeah. You might criticize the individual, you know, people criticizing guys who went to Snowden. I think most people went to Snowden over this weekend or to beach, probably thought they'll find it empty, right? And they want to just get out of the house, you know, and then everyone else was there as well. Okay, you know, but but people are by and large, yes, yes, people have to get to work and there's a lot of complexities and people aren't all adjusting fast enough and there were pictures the day of the London Underground still having people on it and, and all these kind of things. It's true and it's difficult, but look how many people are staying at home. Look how many people are doing that all over the world in order, making their own lives really difficult in order to save others. They may not even have an elderly relative in their family. Totally. That's beautiful. That's yeah. special. Yeah. Agreed. Look how many people are reaching out and helping others. And that's only going to increase in time. Uh, look how many people are doing good things, right? It's, a, it's very special. And let's always remember that as well. Um, so final question. Um, someone suggested that I ask this to you, which I think is a, a great one to finish with. Um, What's your advice for, for uh, things that people can work on and do if, well, we're all going to be quarantining now. So uh, but particularly people who are self-isolating, what, what would you suggest? Well, first of all, whatever you think you could be enriched by with time, I would not waste. I mean, of course, I'm going to waste some time, right? So if there's always been a book you wanted to read, a uh, safer, let's say, in Judaism, you wanted to, pardon me, to learn that you think could have an impact on your life in a positive, this is great, great moments, courses you want to do. These are certainly lots and lots of them available right now but i would again i'd go back to this notion of giving the people need us now people really really need us now if we're in isolation and we don't have an elderly relative who could do with a phone call is there someone someone else out there you know get in if we don't have an idea of what to do ourselves let's get in touch with charities that are looking for volunteers and placing them with people who need us so i would say that we have so much to give and we're going to learn creative things to give so yes in isolation, if we're not, if we're, in, you know, different between people who have people in the same building as them versus people who don't. Um, but we can, we can be building ourselves spiritually. We can building. Our, I say when it comes to prayer, for example, right? The synagogues are all shut right now, so we can't do communal prayer. So often we walk in there, we rely on the spirit of the community to lift us, or the great chazan or the rabbi. We've all got to become the community leader now. Yeah. We are praying individually on behalf of the entire nation and behalf of the entire world. Let's do that properly. Let's develop our own personal prayers with God right now. Let's develop our ability to meditate and, and become calmer people. Let's become wiser and more knowledgeable people. And let's be givers. Let's rise up and be givers. And don't be shy. You know, normally in a normal situation, we're shy to offer to give to somebody or some stranger we never met. This is not a moment for that. This is a crisis. This is an opportunity. And all of us have a very deep godly self, a soul that can really come out now and, and, and be very creative. When we come up with good ideas, let's share them. Um, and, and let's do that. I think there's all good things to be working on, even in quote unquote isolation. And let's remember we're in a blessed world where we're not isolated. There's a day a week, Shabbat and on the festival Yom Tov, where it's just, if we're literally alone in the building, it's us and God. If we're with others, it's us, them and God. But the rest of the week, we're there for the world and the world can be there for us when we need it to. Not to be afraid to call for help when we need it to. We'll need it, others will need us. But yeah, all of all those things, I hope those are helpful uh, suggestions. Well, uh, Rabbi Ray, thank you so much for everything you do. Uh, thank you for your time right now. It's really, really appreciated. Um, we always enjoy having you on uh, JTV and uh, we look forward to sharing uh, your thoughts with everyone. So thank you so much. Arnie, thank you. You're, you're helping everyone by providing good stuff for them. I know. They're in you should be well. Our viewers should be well and Absolutely. also financially well off. And, and please, God, we should all get through this together. But the good amen. should long outlast, outlast this virus. Amen, amen. Great note to finish on. Thank you so much. To stay up to date with JTV content, click subscribe here if you're on YouTube and hit the alarm bell. And if you're on Facebook, hit the like button and under following, click see first. If you enjoy watching JTV content 
and want to help us continue to grow, please consider making a donation to us by clicking here.